I was the first woman in three different supply chain leadership teams. And not only I was different, but I had a different way of thinking. It felt like a constant fight. And so in our roles now as women leaders in supply chain, how do we pay it forward and make it easier for the next generation? You're not doing a woman a favor by being a door opener or being an advocate. I want what's fair. I don't want a favor. And I think that that's a very subtle distinction fairness, not favors. When I take the position of the North Asia supply chain head, I'm actually the first who hold the Chinese passport to take the role and also the first woman to take the role. This is Radical Reinvention, a show by Zero 100 about reimagining the world's supply chains. I'm Victoria Marin. And while I'm not a supply chain professional, I am professionally curious. I'm a journalist and the lead podcast producer here at Zero 100. And since we've started this show, I've learned so much about how supply chains work and what makes them broken. If you've been listening to our show, you know that Zero 100's mission to create 0% carbon, 100% digitized supply chains is at the heart of what we do. We believe this means living in a world where people's needs are met, but the planet is preserved. To do that, we're working together with the world's most innovative supply chain pioneers and industry experts to tackle some of the biggest challenges facing the planet today. And we're inviting all of you along for the ride. Join us as we work to create a more sustainable and responsible supply chain, one radical reinvention at a time. Today, we're celebrating International Women's Day with an epic panel of supply chain pioneers, Sarah Bonode, Jennifer Hahn, and Sherry Heinisch. Sarah is the Vice President of Supply Chain Transformation for the Estee Lauder Companies. She's also worked for L Brands, the parent company behind Victoria's Secret and Bath & Body Works, and for the French postal service La Poste Group. Jennifer is the Chief Product Supply Officer for Nutrition at Unilever. Over her 25-year tenure with the company, Jennifer has served in roles like Senior Supply Chain Director for Go-To-Market in China and the VP Head of Supply Chain for North Asia. Sherry is the host of the Supply Chain Revolution podcast. She's a graduate lecturer of sustainability in supply chain and logistics at the University of Arkansas and has master's degrees in sustainability and supply chain management from Harvard University and Rutgers Business School. I'm thrilled to share their wisdom and insights on a wide range of topics relevant not just to women who work in supply chain or even just to working women. What they talked about is critical to anyone who works alongside other people and wants to champion and bring out the best in them. Sherry, Jennifer, Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd love to kick things off with some introductions in your own words. Sarah, can you start us off? Thanks, Victoria. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Bono, and I am at the Estee Lauder Companies. I lead our e-commerce supply chain and our transformation team in supply chain. I would like to say I had a vocation to go to supply chain, but in reality, I went to business school in France, and I graduated with a specialization in marketing. So supply chain came a bit later in my career. After a reorg, I was given the opportunity to lead both operations and sales. I didn't know anything about operations, so I moved the sales office in our distribution center, and I fell in love with that specific part of my job, and the rest is history. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Jennifer, I'd love to hear a little bit about your career in supply chain and what brought you to this point, too. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm actually the Chief Product Supply Chain Officer for Nutrition for Unilever, and I'm Chinese. It's a quite interesting journey for me to move into supply chain. In my background and university, I'm completely with a literary background, have no relevance to the supply chain and operation. I dream uh, to be a journalist for many years during my education. Finally, I feel the reality 25 years ago in China is not matched with my dream to be a real journalist. So I just switched to business. And the lucky thing is that I got a Unilever scholarship in university. I apply to human resources, but for some reason, they believe I can be a great commercial operator, which including the supply chain and finance and IT. But after a reorg, I finally chose to supply chain to further develop as I really love the diversity and the physical things. You can make a tangible difference to a lot of things and human beings. Sherry, same question for you. How did you get here? What brought you to this moment? My name is Sherry Heinish. I 
have many titles, but the title that I'm most proud of is Mom. I am a host of the Supply Chain Revolution podcast. I currently work at Ernst & Young as the global lead for innovation and ecosystem. I started my journey in supply chain upstream in demand planning and definitely have always been super curious about innovation and technology. I previously was the sustainability services global lead at IBM Consulting. I didn't intend to start in supply chain. I actually started in the arts and in music. And if you ever want to know the connection between music, tempo, orchestration, cadence, experience, journeys, and supply chain, I'm your girl. <laughs> All three of you said you didn't intend to end up in supply chain. You started doing something else. You had passion for something else and discovered a passion for supply chain later on. So my next question is, and I'll start with Sherry for this one, what are you most passionate about when it comes to supply chain? What do you most enjoy about doing the work in this field? I think it's evolved over the years. Almost 40% of the world actually works in a supply chain. And I love the idea of being connected to something much larger than yourself. And whether that's leading with intention, being a purpose-driven or values-driven employee, I wanted to understand how I could make a difference. And supply chain gave me the ability to think about how we've designed our world and the systems in which we exist to get the results that we're getting right now. So for me, I think the connection to people, the ability to really influence a lot of integrated change that happens across business unit, reaching back into the first kilometer of a supply chain for responsible sourcing and social impact, but then also looking at human behavior and how I can help human beings make better, more responsible decisions. As I've progressed in my career, being intentional with creating a sustainable workforce has been a passion of mine. Also being an inclusion and equity champion advocate whenever I have the opportunity to not only be a door opener, but also be a voice for folks who are underrepresented, but certainly qualified to lead in supply chain and then more broadly in sustainability and changing the world that we share. Right. Sarah, you said you went to Estee Lauder because of how intentional that company is about diversity and inclusivity. I'd love to hear what it is that you're most passionate about and what you most enjoy about your job. I really recognize that often I speak from a position of privilege. Overall, 55% of our global VP positions are held by women. And like over 80% of our workforce is women. And that translates in supply chain. Our global supply chain is over 50% women. So right now, for me, working in supply chain, it means working in a diverse team, which is absolutely phenomenal. I truly like the discipline of supply chain itself. It's pace, the fact that it's always evolving. But above all, I like supply chain because it's centered around people. And like you can have an impact on people and you have an impact on the world that they live in. So that's really what I fell in love with. When I took on my first distribution center, the company was not doing well. The people were not treated well in the distribution center. And just by changing the culture, the management practices that turned into operational excellence, that turned into one of the best functioning operations that we had. So it's really a people function. And that's really what I love. Jennifer, I'm especially curious, because you have that background in journalism, if kind of that love of telling stories and talking to people has influenced the career that you have now. If I look back, I feel my whole career journey is actually a learning journey. So I uh, study and I learn from day one in the work for finance. I also learn IT, a lot of the business. The supply chain world is such a big learning opportunity. The diversity of the functionality in the supply chain is huge. The planning, the logistics, distribution, the manufacturing, the engineering, the procurement, the knowledge you need across the whole supply chain is so diversified. And you can keep learning for so many years. 
years and every year you get new things. And that is also linked with a bit of the curiosity that I gain from my literature and the journalist background. I really curious for the new environment, the new knowledge, the different places, how people live and operate and what is the difference of the culture, etc., etc. The second one is I really enjoy to see the things can be physically realized not purely an intellectual gain or a number itself, but you see the tangible benefit and the tangible difference we can make on the day-to-day operation. And uh, then the third piece, the positive impact we can make in a big scope. I think supply chain is the function you can actually influence most of society. You have so many workers, so many suppliers, so many distribution center workers, especially with the nutrition business in Unilever. We deal with so many farmers, which you can affect very big scope of the ecosystem. So anything good we are doing, the influence is actually huge. I pulled up some stats and... 57% of supply chain workers are men compared to 43% of women, which maybe doesn't seem like it's too imbalanced. But when you start breaking that down, you're looking at only 20% of delivery drivers, only 30% of warehouse workers. And then if you start moving up the ladder, only 19% of C-suite positions, 17% of CSCOs are women, only 8% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. And so It seems like there are a lot of places where there's opportunities for women to find more gender equity. In your personal experience, what has been the biggest challenge in your career? And has that been because of being a woman? Jennifer, I'd love to start with you first. I can share some story. Many years ago, when I get promoted to the supply chain vice president, and we have a leadership meeting in our training center in London, and it's quite interesting that I'm the actually the only woman and I'm actually also the only Asian. So after the training and the meeting in the daytime, and we are actually in the night to drink in the bar. And there's all the conversation and the chat you have with all those men. They talk about soccer, about all the jokes that I don't understand at all. I feel just so lonely. So from that, I realized that it's not only one or two peoples that can make diversity and balance of the organization. You have to have the ecosystem. Imagine in that leadership team, we have half, half team. Then I will be very easy. I can chat with my female colleagues and we can have better chance and more chance to be more authentic. I've also been oftentimes the only woman in the room, the youngest woman in the room. And I didn't start in supply chain or technology, I sort of stumbled into the profession or the field. I went back to school as a single mother. I got my first master's in supply chain management, my second master's in sustainability and about eight professional certifications. And I thought if I did all of those things that I would be respected and treated equitably as a woman. But oftentimes what happens is The answer will be no, not based on your ability or your contribution, but simply because you are different. And that is a very common bias that I have hit my head against in my career, the affinity bias. So favoring the similar over the different. There are gendered standards that will ultimately influence an organization, the culture, and then more broadly, public policy in society. And these are the ways that human beings favor men over women. And these biases exist today, even though a lot of them are veiled, even in the Women at Work, the McKinsey study that comes out annually. It's very clear that there is a business case for cognitive diversity, inclusive workspaces, and representation at every layer of an organization. So for me, I was very quiet, sat on the sidelines, did the work, did great work, often supporting a CSCO or a very senior leader. And I found out I was getting paid less than a male counterpart. And I was like, this is BS. I raised my hand. I finally stood up for myself and the unique value that I contributed to that organization at the time. And that was how the Supply Chain Queen name started. It was a bit tongue in cheek. You have to have that healthy disrespect for the status quo and the courage to lead disruptive thinking and disruptive leadership. And no one prepared me for that. 
No one in my family ever has risen to the C-suite. So I didn't have that role model or that mentoring. But I think the biggest lesson for me is know your worth and don't ask people to proofread the vision that you have for your life. I have this mantra of speak what you seek until you see what you've said and never, ever, ever give up. Speak what you seek until you see what you've said. Wow, I love that. Sarah, how do you increase representation, diversity, inclusion in the supply chain? Like what is Estee Lauder doing that maybe other companies can learn from? You know, just listening to Jennifer and Sherry, it's like, I will have the same themes. It's a good reminder of why we have such a big mission as women in supply chain. I too have felt isolated. I was the first woman in three different supply chain leadership teams. And Jennifer, you were talking about everyone talking about the same thing, like soccer and the same uniform thinking. And not only I was different, but I had a different way of thinking. I think the other piece, like Sherry, you mentioned it, but it was not enough to just be competent and have incredible results, right? You just had to be more to actually be recognized. And in my early years in supply chain, it felt like a constant fight. And so so in our roles now as women leaders in supply chain, how do we pay it forward and make it easier for the next generation? So like at Estee Lauder companies, investing in women is really intentional. Our founder, Mrs. Estee Lauder, was a very strong woman. My wonderful boss, Roberto Canavari, is also a big proponent of women. So it starts from the top, right? So we have a group called Women in Supply Chain. It's an employee resource group that connects our supply chain community together, that cultivates an environment of learning, leadership, coaching to foster talent and development under a women's leadership network umbrella. And so that creates an environment where we advocate for women internally, externally. There is a, an enormous mentors, sponsors network at the Lauder. I personally sponsor over 10 women across our global supply chain team. And we are in a really good place, right? Over 50% women in our supply chain, but we're not done, right? We need to continue to bring the representation, especially in the leadership levels. I've been in Unilever for 25 years, and the company that I completely share the value, which is we really have a clear purpose on the sustainability and also a much diversified and inclusive organization in the things. To improve the diversity and inclusion in supply chain is definitely a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's coming from recruitment, how to attract more young talent, more female talent to nurture and how to support like Sarah talked about the mentorship, the community, the supporting system, the starting point for the gender diversity in a lot of the big company, especially in supply chain, or especially in a certain function like engineering, like manufacturing. Victoria, you mentioned if you look at the gender balance, looks quite okay-ish. But if you deep dive to specific function, the supply chain, the manufacturing, engineering, and also the C-suite or the senior level, then the woman representative is really low. So try to turn around quickly. You need to push a bit. Like for the external recruitment, we at least want to have the gender balance of the recruitment. And when we try to do the internal promotion, we also say we need to have a balanced woman. And in Unilever globally, we have quite a lot of manufacturing. Now we are gender balanced already, meaning our worker is 50% woman and 50% men, which is super difficult in some area like in India, in South Asia, in Vietnam. So that really needs a commitment top down. Right, right. What is the biggest change you've seen over the course of your career for women in supply chain? And what are you surprised has not yet changed? Sherry, we'll start with you. I'll start with the end, what hasn't changed. When you step back and you look at the two biggest risks facing business and humanity, the first is climate change, and then the second is social inequities. When you think about the Vision 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 interconnected goals that really focus on what a responsible, equitable, inclusive, safe world means... That is the roadmap for a sustainable supply chain. Generational poverty is something that I think hasn't changed, and it takes decades. Families, often women, communities, often underrepresented, are already being marginalized by the effects of climate change, are unable to meet basic needs. 
That means they can't improve their well-being over the long term because they have a lack of access to resources, opportunities. You need to create those avenues to education, to health care. All of that impacts most likely the communities where you operate, especially as supply chain leaders. You have to support social safety nets and other measures, including reaching back earlier really removing a lot of the biases that start at the beginning of a hiring process. What words are you using? How are you sourcing candidates from a diverse pool to attract the right talent? You have to demonstrate an inclusive work environment. This isn't just like flexible working. It's also experimenting with new ways of sourcing those people. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. (laughs) I mean, this is really where you can source the most diverse candidates who are going to help you rethink and shift paradigms within your supply chain organization. And they likely have unconventional backgrounds, and it won't be on a standard job board. It won't be on LinkedIn. I love the idea of stay interviews. Adam Grant always talks about stay interviews. If people are doing a kick-ass job, reward them, incentivize the right behavior, And I think what you start to see is a very organic, holistic, and transparent, honest change in your organization. We have to recognize that true diversity means bringing people from different backgrounds that often have very heavy responsibilities in their personal lives. We have single moms, we have people that take care of a multi-generational family. And I think we need to continue to be intentional about building work schedules and career paths that acknowledge that and allow for pauses sometimes without impacting your ability to grow in your career. How are we building our shifts to allow uh, people who have responsibilities outside of the workplace to still have a thriving career? I think that's the next level of investment. According to a report that Zero One Hundred published last year, women in supply chain are more likely to experience career interruptions due to demands of caretaking work. And that comes in the form of reducing their hours, 14% more women than men do that, taking significant time off or quitting. We're looking at 15 to 17% more women do that versus men. And it's a much smaller number, but also turning down promotions. More women are doing that than men because of the demands of caretaking work. Jennifer, what is it that we can do as supply chain professionals to narrow that gap? If I compare now versus 25 years ago, there's a lot of things has been changed already. When I look back many, many years ago, I can't imagine what the senior women supply chain leaders will look like. It's just simply you don't have that role model in the system. Just share my own experience. When I get the role for the chief supply chain officer for nutrition internal announcement, our CEO did mention that this is in Unilever history. I'm the first executive vice president level as a female. So then I get a lot of thank you and congratulation letters. And a lot of them, they say simply there is a such a big belief and a confidence for me that it's possible. And now we have some role model. So your career is also a marathon. And in your different life stage, take the priority, take your time and make it clear. Don't feel so stressful that you need to do everything great at one time. I also have a relatively stable or slow progression in my career because of my maternity leave and I need to take care more of the family and the kids. It's okay to pause for one or two years or slow down a bit. I think it's also the diversity of the leadership style. Years ago, though we have women in leadership, but the style is typical, very male style. But I think we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of different styles of leadership. People can be gentle, can speak slow, not necessarily always aggressive. Some people will have a very different life approach. Right, right. The prevailing idea that to get to a leadership role, you have to think like a man or act like a man. How can men, particularly men that are in positions of power, be better advocates for all of these things that we're talking about? In my career, the split has been 50-50 in terms of men who genuinely want to help, who are allies, who are sponsors, who are advocates, who speak your name in rooms, who advocate for the promotion and equitable treatment in the workplace 
but we have a long way to go. I think that there needs to be a baseline understanding of the difference between equality and equity, meeting people where they are, and that looks very different depending on the person. It's not a uniform, you treat women this way. The other thing is, this isn't a favor. Like you're not doing a woman a favor by being a door opener or being an advocate. I want what's fair. I don't want a favor. And I think that that's a very subtle distinction. Fairness, not favors. My own boss, right, he actually recognized the value of diversity of thinking of backgrounds on our team and how it makes us so much better as a team. It multiplies the impact we can have. This is really one of the big things. It's a shared responsibility, right? Being intentional at making supply chain as a destination for women and the true career path. And you often need someone to watch over our career path with that, being very intentional about this. I talked about sponsoring women in supply chain, but also having men that sponsor a woman's career to help really invest and make sure that every woman that wants to have a career, you are being given the right opportunities to get there. Women need sponsors or advocates, people that like truly advocates for them when they're not in the room and invest in their careers. Mentors will tell you what to do. And it's great to have mentors, but it's really about someone who will give you the opportunities. And I'll tell you that just happened to me. Like Between my boss and our HR leader, Claire McIntyre, before I got promoted to lead our whole transformation team. And that happened not because I asked for this job, but because they saw my potential before I even saw that I could do this job. And I, like, it was brought to me because of that sponsorship. So I'm a firm believer that's an investment in everyone's career. I agree. I think mentoring can look different also. Reverse mentoring has been really valuable for me in my career in unlocking some of my own biases. I do want to create the intention and the space for redefining feminism at work. We need to acknowledge that not everyone wants to be a mother or have children. Also, someone can give you advice Someone can be advocating for you, maybe not necessarily in the way that you want them to. And you have to be bold and you have to understand your unique value proposition and your worth and be able to clearly articulate that. I think also both men and women will need mentors and advocates. And though, because we haven't reached a proper balance yet, so women will just need more mentors and advocates. Then in terms of the mentorship and also the advocates, I think mentorship actually provides quite unique psychological safety to share more emotion things, more personal stuff, and no limitation with your career or business, but more as a human being, as an individual, will actually provide a push in the system to help you. I'm curious about what lessons you all have learned through mentoring other women in your career. I personally believe to make a big impact and a change in the system. Then women stay together to share, to support each other. But that will not shift the needle too much. I think we have to completely step up the male sponsorship and the leadership to be with us to drive this agenda together. Like Sherry said, it's not a favor. It's not purely a woman's agenda. It's not purely one or two leaders' agenda. It's the coal company's agenda. What has been the champagne moment, the highlight of your career to date? Sherry, I saw you kind of chuckle with that one, so I'd love to hear from you first. Oh, this is so good. The champagne moment, I distinctly think of two. I think I mentioned the catalyst for change and me raising my hand and finding my voice, that provocation. It's definitely knowing your worth. And when you know your worth, you move differently, you speak differently. And I think that this also correlates to the mentoring piece as well, because when you mentor over the years, you both learn. I consider myself an eternal student, and it's definitely been a beacon for me in my career. I think the other champagne moment is at some point I stopped asking people who I reported to or very senior leaders who happen to be men to proofread the vision that I had for my life. Like, stop asking people who have no idea where you're going and they've never been there for directions. I think rewarding, caring, and stewardship and incentivizing those behaviors and shifting that model of profitability at all costs 
to creating a culture of caring and a culture of sustainable well-being. Every time one of my team members, mentees or former team members gets promoted or moves forward to a new exciting role, that's a celebration moment. It's a champagne moment for me. Last year, a young woman from one of my former teams was promoted to vice president, the same level I am. She was a high potential manager at the time. We spent a lot of time working together. It was just so good to celebrate this milestone in her career. That's beautiful. I love that. Jennifer, same question to you. For me, the champagne moment is really when I take the position of the North Asia supply chain head. I'm actually the first who hold the Chinese passport to take the role and also the first woman to take the role. And interestingly, when I just get that promotion, the things is moving to the COVID as a crisis. So that's really super, super tough and stress several months, then you have to make a very tough decision to say, should we go on for the operation to secure the society or we should take care of our people and what is the countermeasure you should have to protect our people in the whole supply chain. And after that, I really hear my colleagues, both from business and from supply chain to see, oh, during that time, you're really so calm. And while we are so nervous and nobody know what is the right things to do, your unique calmness as a kind of leadership really give the confidence level and give everybody the trust that we will go through it together. So that is really quite an aha moment with my Chinese background, with my unique style. I'm not the normal stereotype of the leaders that show the passion so aggressively and you just speak loudly. I'm a relatively calm and introvert. I do not speak too much, but I know that I can make a difference with my unique style. I can still lead the team even in the most toughest moments. We hear a lot about the glass ceiling, but the glass cliff is a really interesting phenomenon that happens often in times of crisis, downturns, or some sort of leadership opportunity that women or a member of an underrepresented group is given when the risk of failure is highest. There's a distinction between a growth opportunity and really leaning in, digging in your heels and saying, I know this is a challenge. I'm up for the challenge. I'm ready to take it on. But the glass cliff, what you find specifically in the corporate world is women many times are given very high risk growth opportunities where the risk of failure is typically higher than some of the promotion or growth opportunities given to their male counterparts. Sometimes you may take a bit more risk and especially any failure will be exemplified in a way. If you have some appointment with a man and it's failed, it's a normal thing. But if you take extra mile to promote a woman and it failed, then it's become a quite vivid example. But actually that risk is happened in both women and men. But because of the scarcity of the woman as a percentage, you will see that failure is actually become bigger. So that is also the other element of glass cliff. So here's the last question I have. Why, despite all of these challenges that we're still coming up against and all of the work that's still left to be done, why should more women pursue careers in supply chain? It's the best place to be. <laughs> it's always exciting. It's a people-centered function, and it's going to keep on evolving nonstop for the next years. Supply chain is cool, and I think supply chains really hold the power to change the world in an accelerated pace. If you have the passion to do good for yourself, to do good for society and the good for this planet, I think supply chain have the biggest impact. That is my fundamental belief. All right, friends, that brings us to the end of our time together. That's it for Radical Reinvention Episode 10. Happy International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Month. Thank you to Sarah Bonod, Jennifer Hahn, and Sherry Heinisch for joining me today. I really did learn so much from you and truly left our conversation inspired. You can find the links referenced throughout the episode in the show notes in the episode description. And our earlier episodes are available wherever you find podcasts. As always, Zero 100 community members have exclusive access to our full interviews from earlier episodes online at Zero100.com. See you next time. 
This episode of Radical Reinvention was produced by Diane Hope, Nick Heineman, Ursuline Kahn, Catherine Perry, and me, Victoria Marin. Ko Takasugi Chernovin is our editor and sound engineer and also composed our theme music. To find out more about Zero 100 and to check out our content library, go to Zero100.com. If you're interested in joining our community of contributors, send us a note at hello at Zero100.com. <laughs>